So first, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Neil Horlick. Um, uh, Dr. Horlick came to us from uh, George Washington University School of Medicine in DC and completed his residency at the University of Illinois, um, Chicago College of Medicine, and, con and did his undergraduate studies in cell and molecular biology at Tulane University in New Orleans. After his residency, Dr. Horlick volunteered his medical skills in Africa for two years before returning to private practice in the US. He taught African doctors, OBGYN, practices at uh, University of Maryland, Charles Reed. Oh, but, uh, no, what's the... Uh, uh, so, uh, so going, so there you go. And St. Benedict's Hospital in Tanzania, <coughs> East Africa. So that's Dr. Horlick. Okay, good evening. Uh, and then I mean, I'll just go down and introduce him, and then we'll start all over. Dr. Aaron was born and raised in Cape May, New Jersey, and he's very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> he attended the University of, uh, University of Medicine and Dentistry at New Jersey Robert Wood Johnson uh -huh. Medical School completed his residency at Medical College of Pennsylvania. Dr. Aaron has been practicing, if this says 18 years, is that true? More than 18 years? More than 18 I years. I thought, I thought. <laughs> Another year is gone by. And then, and then he's board certified in obstetrics and gynecology and is a fellow of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists. Um, the Gladys Wilkins, our physician assistant, certified physician assistant, she received her bachelor's degree from Howard University Physician Assistant Program, I won't tell them what year, and she received her Master of Science in Advanced Physician Assistant Studies at Arizona School of Health Sciences. She specialized in OBGYN and women's health for more than 20 years and has held active medical staff appointments at many hospitals, including University of Maryland Charles Regional Medical Center. She is a distinguished fellow at the American Academy of Physician Assistants. So, class Wilkins. Dr. Erica Contreras is, oh, was born and raised in Durham, North Carolina. That will come out when she starts talking, you'll know that. <laughs> and completed her undergraduate studies at Xavier University in Louisiana, and then attended East Carolina Brody School of Medicine and completed her residency at East Carolina University Pitt County Memorial Hospital in Greenville. Greenville, North Carolina. She is a member of the um, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and American Medical Association, and you're going to have to help me with this one, American Association of Gynecologic Laparoscopy. Thank you. And <laughs> Dr. Erica Contreras. And then at the end of the table, Dr. Eleanor Faraday. Um, I think she's the newest member of our family, right? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Dr. Faraday specializes in general surgery with a special concentration in breast cancer and breast conditions. She received her undergraduate degree from University of Massachusetts and attended Albany Medical School, Medical College in New York, and completed her internship and residency at George. Town University Hospital, local girl. Dr. Faraday served in the U.S. Air Force from 2008 through 2012 and served as Chief of General Surgery at Andrews Air Force Base and Staff General Surgeon at Fort Belvoir. During her years of service, she did a tour of duty in Iraq from November 2009 to May 2010, as a, served as a trauma surgeon in Kirkuk. Kirkuk? That's right. correct. Thanks. Dr. Eleanor Faraday. So without further ado, we'll start with Dr. Horlick. For ovarian cancer, some of the symptoms can a lot of times be uh, vague or nonspecific symptoms. Women can have pain or pressure. Generally, they can mimic like GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting. Um, there can be changes in uh, like GI symptoms like constipation, um, loss of appetite or early satiety, meaning women can get uh, fuller a lot quicker than usual. Um, increased abdominal girth, meaning that like if you notice a little bit more distension or sometimes the clothes are not, feel, are not fitting properly, <coughs> low energy or um, or more back pain, generally uh, very kind of nonspecific or um, symptoms. The risk factors for ovarian cancer, there's, there's a lot of different risk factors, um, generally advancing age. If there's any family history, a family history of ovarian cancer, especially if it's in a first degree relative, like uh, the mother, sister, um, you know, mom, sister, or, um, daughter. Um, obviously, if, if there's a positive BRCA mutation, um, obesity, uh, any personal history of any breast cancers, uh, less, you know, especially for patients who are less than 40 years old. Also, early onset of menarche, meaning that if it's early age of first having the menstrual cycle um, or late menopause, sometimes because we know that if there's more ovulatory cycles during the reproductive years, a lot of times that can, um, is just predisposed to having a higher risk for getting ovarian cancer. Um, when we talk about screening, there's really no good um, standardized way to kind of screen for ovarian cancer. So we don't have any, a screening test is basically a test to look and see for any patients who may or may not have risk factors if there's any risk for developing um, ovarian cancer. 
And we have a lot of good screening tests for other kind of cancers. So for ovarian cancer, generally we can do things like general, like a pelvic exam or an annual exam, feeling the adnexa or the ovaries and feeling for any kind of masses or tenderness and doing things like also with a transvaginal ultrasound is one way to look and see on imaging to see if ultrasound suggests any cysts or masses um, by the ovaries, obviously. And then a blood test called a CA-125 level is a blood, it's a tumor marker, which sometimes can be used to, um, to look and see if it's, of course, if it's positive, then it would be, suggest that possibly there's a link to ovarian cancer, especially in postmenopausal. It's more accurate in postmenopausal women. If it, um, we do generally do the test if patients do have risk factors or if there is any kind of ovarian cyst or mass, um, and if we have any suspicion, then we would do a blood test called a CA-125 level um, is generally how the how the screening works. I guess with that I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Aaron. Hi. Um, I'm just going to discuss breast cancer screening kind of in the general population and we'll talk a little later about it in women that are higher risk. Um, there's three components of breast cancer screening the way most people talk about it. There's imaging which is a mammogram for most women and clint what they call a clinical breast exam meaning when you go to your provider the examination that they do and then there were called breast self-exams, which actually has come under some discussion the last few years, and now there's a concept of breast self-awareness, and I'll touch on that a little bit in a couple seconds. What has been controversial in the last few years has been how often to do this testing. Um, about 2010, there was a U.S. Preventive Services Task Force that came out with some new recommendations that were uh, much less often than most of us have been used to started talking about women not doing mammograms until they were 50 and only doing them every other year and not even doing their own breast self-exams. That information kind of was based on some financial statistics as much as anything else. And basic, basically, we know the risk of breast cancer goes up as women get older and whether the cost-benefit analysis was worth it. Um, you might imagine many of our medical societies kind of took some offense with that, valuing a life uh, financially. So um, the American College of OBGYN, which was OBGYNs belong to, the American Cancer Society, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, and the National Cancer Institute all have their own recommendations that are pretty similar, where they discuss doing mammograms every year from the age of 40, um, with breast exams every one to three years from about 20 to 39, and every year after 40, and also the concept of breast self-awareness. Where that concept came along was there's a, a term that I always have to keep forgetting, but it's called sojourn time, which is basically involves the point from when something is not visible on a mammogram until it's visible on a mammogram before when it would be palpable or you can feel it yourself. Because that's the idea with the screening methods. We want to be able to find something before you can find it. You can feel a mass. We don't necessarily need to do a mammogram. Um, and what they found is that a mammogram can usually detect something between one millimeter and one centimeter, which is roughly stage one of a disease. Like any other disease, you'd want to catch it. The earlier the stage, the better you would do. And that's where that, uh, so that's where those recommendations came from. We found that in the 40s, that doing it every year, that was enough time that since it could take up to three years from that time it went from one millimeter to one centimeter. Um, other uh, imaging that's kind of a discuss a lot now is that there's now what's called the digital mammogram, which is basically a computer-enhanced mammogram versus just the films that they looked at. And that's still a little bit controversial. It probably will replace the film mammograms in the next few years, um, since it does maybe improve detection a little bit, especially in women that are under 60 versus women that are older 60. Ultrasound is not by itself a very useful tool yet, and mostly it's used when there's something on the mammogram that's a little bit abnormal or questionable of trying to feel out see if it's something you're seeing on the mammogram, which is really like an x-ray versus the ultrasound, which maybe can almost three-dimensionally characterize it. The other thing that we're hearing more and more about are MRIs, which is a very expensive test, magnetic resonance imaging, but still by itself is not considered a screening tool by itself in the average risk women. Dr. Faraday is going to discuss that a little more later with BRCA patients. But people talk about possibly doing that in women that are high risk, meaning a 20% risk for breast cancer or not. And, and lastly, of course, is the breast exam. The breast self-exam is where women, it used to be kind of a more organized exam. We would tell women this is a certain way to do it, whether you, every month, just following your period, 
moving a certain organized way. A lot of women found that very intimidating. They were worried about that. Am I doing it right or doing it wrong? I feel a lot of little tiny things. It would be very anxiety provoking. So a lot of women weren't doing it. And in the last few years, a concept has come along which is called breast self-awareness, just being aware of how their breasts normally feel. When she, if she feels any change, then notifying her provider. And to me, that just seems like the smartest way to do things. And they found that um, with normal mammograms don't pick up everything. And about 7.4 cases per thousand screenings where there's a, a woman to feel a mass and have a normal mammogram, it actually is cancer. So that's why it's still very important for women to do their own breast exams. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gladys. The next step. <laughs> All right. So in ovarian and breast cancer, we know that there is an inherited genetic risk to developing. So there is a breast cancer um, screening test um, for genes that a patient may have that can give us an estimate of whether that patient is a risk for breast cancer based on um, family members that also have breast cancer. So the breast cancer gene test is a blood test that uses DNA analysis and it's a simple blood test drawn from your arm, nothing invasive, and it uses DNA analysis to identify harmful changes or mutations in either one or two of the breast cancer susceptibility genes, which is the breast cancer gene one or two. Um, so we know that these women are at increased risk for developing, if they test positive, which we'll talk about in a minute, are at an increased risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer, which makes it a great uh, screening tools if um, family members close to you have breast cancer. So I'm just um, going to talk about, you know, how we manage if your screen comes back positive as it relates to ovarian cancer. Um, so like Glass was saying, it's a mutation, and it's been shown that women who have this BRCA mutation can have up to a 44% chance of having ovarian cancer, um, which is very high, which is why we want to intervene as soon as possible, try to get your risk reduced as close to zero as possible. Um, so the management in someone who has a positive test is really going to depend on a few things. One, how old you are at time of diagnosis, your reproductive history or um, kind of where you are as it relates to reproduction. And then, of course, your personal preference. Obviously, some of our younger patients who are maybe like 28 who have not started having children yet, um, you know, we want to start surveillance, but we might not want to be as aggressive as take doing surgery because they haven't had the opportunity to have children. <coughs> now, on someone who's already decided, who's either already had their children or decided, you know, I don't want kids anyway, then, you know, that kind of changes what we can do. Um, and there's also medical management, and that would be use of birth control pills because we know in general population that does help to reduce the risk of ovarian cancer in women um, but it's not as uh, clearly defined as like a definitive use for um, management for women who have the positive BRCA for ovarian cancer um, and then the next thing in terms of management is you know are we going to increase surveillance or will we move towards surgery so increased surveillance consists of um, doing pelvic exams more frequently they recommend twice a year and the idea is, you know, we might be able to pick up something on physical exam if I feel a mass or if the patient had a complaint. And then if we feel something, then we would move toward imaging. Um, and surveillance also includes doing pelvic ultrasound <coughs> because unfortunately on physical exam, um, you know, it's not going to be as, I can't feel everything, um, but an ultrasound can pick up things way better than I can feel. Um, so the goal is we're trying to use all our resources to find anything that's going to make us concerned so we can do something about it as soon as possible. Um, and a little bit of like what Dr. Horlick was talking about, the blood test, the CA-125, um, that's something that can kind of help us guide us if it's, you know, very elevated in a patient versus not as it relates to our concern for someone who's tested positive. And a lot of times we'll use that blood test in someone who has already um, had ovarian cancer that's been treated surgically and then we're following them postoperatively um, because if we see that that blood level is increasing that could be a concern for a reoccurrence of their cancer. Um, and in terms of surgery, the recommendation is to do what's called a bilateral salping oophorectomy which means that we take both the ovaries out. And the goal being by getting rid of the ovaries then obviously we're reducing the risk of ovarian cancer um, highly as close to zero as possible 
And also by taking out the ovaries and the fallopian tubes, we also help to reduce the risk of breast cancer in these women as well. Um, and ideally, we'd like to do it by age 40, because presumably most women have finished their reproductive, they're done having children. But um, you know, sometimes we might not get a patient until they're over 40, so that doesn't mean that we're not going to do that if that's you know, what we decide and discuss. Um, but ideally, we'd like to get them out sooner because we're helping to decrease the risk of cancer by not having that organ sitting there for a long time with the potential to develop into cancer. Um, and by removing the ovaries and fallopian tubes, it can reduce the risk by as much as 85 to 90 percent, which is an excellent risk reduction. Um, and uh, in terms, so that's you know typically how we manage. But like I said, if your test came back positive, you know all as a group we meet individually and kind of discuss what is best for you because you know everybody will you know we individualize care. So if you know surgery is not something you want to do, then we would make sure we're increasing our surveillance so we can still try to catch something as soon as possible. Um, or if you're at the point where you're ready for surgery, then that's an option as well. Of course, with all our end goal being trying to reduce your risk of cancer as much as possible. Um, and then, you know, if your test, so let's say, you know, you have a good family history, but your test was negative, that doesn't mean that your risk is now zero because you don't have the mutation. Um, we still need to pay attention and um, do our screening based on how early the person, the youngest person was who got diagnosed, so we can continue to follow and still try to manage as, and try to reduce your risk as much as possible. So now Dr. Ferry will talk about uh, as it relates to breast cancer. So the, the studies that we hear and the numbers that we hear in public that are very common is, you know, one in eight women are going to face breast cancer. And that, that's about 12% of the population. So, you know, you have that, you know, you have a one in, one out of 12 women, I'm sorry, is, you know, what you're going to focus on. So if you have a positive BRCA, your risk goes up about five times the average women. So it's a 60% risk, which of course is you are automatically in that high risk category. However, it's important to emphasize that not everyone with a BRCA1 positive or BRCA2 positive test gets cancer. Not everybody does. It's just that your risk is significantly increased versus the general population. So my approach to talking to patients about this is that there's several options, and you're gonna see a trend and why we kind of focus this talk that there's surveillance, there's surgery, there's some medical options, um, and really this, this is a patient preference um, because this is, you know, when you do this study and you get these test results, this is information that that is helping predict your future it's not necessarily your right now you know you you not every woman who gets this study done has breast cancer today it's what does this mean for me 10 years from now what does this mean for me 20 years from now what does this mean for my daughters so this is very weighty information and is certainly important to think about when you're going forward so when when i think about what are the options surveillance is one of very reasonable option. We heighten the surveillance. As Dr. Aaron talked about, there's very clear guidelines that, again, we, we hear about it in the newspapers. After 40, get your mammogram, you know, get your breast exams done, you know, check, be self-aware, do your breast exams, know your own tissue. That's what I tell my patients. Self-breast exams are controversial in whether or not they actually make a difference, but I tell them, know your own breasts, know your tissue, because you're the ones who are able to detect a difference most quickly because you know you're with them every day so I mean that's just the you know I'm not there every day I can't be there every day so um, the, the surveillance in someone who is it has a positive bracket test um, changes so if you're um, if you're finding out and you're in your 20s we recommend surveillance um, to start at age 25 instead of age 40. And these are the, um, the, NAC, the NCN guidelines, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. We start that surveillance at age 25 mammograms. Generally, we wouldn't do mammograms in women that young because the density of the breast does not necessarily show us as much information as we would get. That's why we start at age 40. But we would start at age 25 or we would start 10 years before the first member of your family was diagnosed. 
because obviously if you're arriving at a BRCA testing, you have an aunt, a sister, a mom, someone who is diagnosed, maybe multiple people who are diagnosed. So we look at who is diagnosed first, because we know that these women who get breast cancer will get it most likely earlier in life, so often before age 40 and certainly before age 50. So we take that and we, we either do the surveillance 10 years before the first diagnosis, or if you're very young, we started at age 25. So annual, um, annual imaging at age 25 mammogram. And then we do clinical breast exams instead of once a year at age 40 or once every three years earlier than that, we recommend that we do it every six months. So basically you would see a provider every six months um, for a clinical breast exam, you'd get a mammogram um, every year starting at age 25. In addition, um, Dr. Ann brought up MRI. MRI is something um, that is a newer modality. It is very sensitive, and what that means is it shows us a lot. It shows us a lot, and, and some people would say, well, why not do that on everybody? Well, because we would be doing a lot of biopsies on people, and we would, they would be negative which doesn't necessarily help people because we're putting them through invasive procedures which carry risk without a necessarily uh, a good option for benefit. We do recommend MRIs in patients whose risk of breast cancer is greater than 20% in their lifetime. And certainly if you test positive with BRCA1 or BRCA2, we know that your risk is certainly higher than 20%. So we recommend an annual MRI for screening. And actually the way that I approach these patients is I stagger the imaging. So I would recommend a mammogram annually, an MRI annually, I stagger those by six months, and then I have a clinical evaluation every six months. So every six months you're getting some imaging and you're getting a physician to examine you. So we're, we're really closely monitoring you because of that um, high risk. And the goal here is to detect something as early as possible so that the greatest chance we have to treat it successfully and cure you because breast cancer we know can be cured. And so we want to detect it as soon as possible so we can cure it. So that's the surveillance component. The next component is surgery. So some women do opt to get a prophylactic um, bilateral mastectomy. And what that means, prophylactic means you haven't been diagnosed with cancer, um, but we would do both sides and, and you have your breasts removed. So you remove all the breast tissue that's possible. Now, this reduces your risk significantly. Um, it's about 90, in some cases, 95% we've shown reduction of risk of developing breast cancer. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't reduce your risk by 100% because even when we take all of the breast tissue possible, there's still some tissue there that you know, we, can't, we can't remove. I mean, that's just, um, it's just not possible. So um, we can't reduce your risk 100%, but we can get pretty close 90 to 95%. Um, one note about surgery is that especially there's been a lot of media coverage of celebrities and it's, it's actually great for the disease. It gives it a lot of exposure and ups the public awareness. Um, you may hear about the nipple sparing mastectomy. So that's a, a special kind of breast surgery where um, all the breast tissue is removed but the skin around the nipple and areola complex is is preserved so that you, when you, if you get reconstruction, you have a much more natural appearance because you're retaining your natural nipple. Um, what that means, we don't know. There are studies ongoing because obviously you're keeping a little bit more of your native tissue, and so we don't think, and there haven't been any any indications in early studies that this increases your risk over having all of the tissue removed but it's certainly an ongoing process. The American Society of Breast Surgeons has a registry for nipple sparing mastectomies and we're actually watching and tracking that data. So, um, so you may hear there's two different kinds of surgeries and regardless of what kind of surgery you get done, immediate reconstruction is encouraged if it's something you're interested in and it's always an option and there's lots of options about that. Certainly that's beyond the scope of this talk but um, there's a lot of options about what, you know, what, um, what you can go forward with. So um, that's the kind of surgical component. And then um, there is some medication out there that does decrease the risk of breast cancer. Um, it's medication that we use for our breast cancer patients who are not necessarily BRCA positive patients. Um, you may have heard of tamoxifen or raloxifen. 
Um, they've been, um, in the 90s, there was a very large breast cancer trial which showed that in women who have breast cancer, if you take tamoxifen for five years after um, diagnosis and treatment, it reduces your risk by about 50%. Um, so it's very significant, and it's actually been shown to decrease the risk of patients developing breast cancer in patients who just have high risk um, uh, factors, including um, atypical cells, or if you've had a biopsy that shows um, tissue that's not breast cancer, but it can be a, considered a precancerous lesion. So it's very effective. Um, there's not a lot of clear data to say specifically, does this um, impact the BRCA patients any differently? But we know that in BRCA2, um, there have been some good studies showing it reduces your risk by about 60%. So it's definitely a component of the approach because anything that's going to decrease your risk is going to be beneficial. And there are women who do surveillance with tamoxifen. There are women who opt to do surgery with um, with tamoxifen. And really, it's it's there are risks, you know, to medication. There are risks to surgeries. And this is part of the whole conversation of going through this process and learning this about yourself and kind of deciding, well, how how can I approach this in a way that I feel like I can take control of myself? Um, the only other thing I'd mention is there are some good studies put out. In, in the li surgical literature that just an overall healthy lifestyle does decrease our risk of breast cancer. Things like obesity, alcohol consumption, um, cholesterol levels, those are, there's not, um, there's not, I can't give you definitive risk reduction numbers, but there are significant trends that we've seen, and so that's another thing, just taking control of your life and living a healthy, healthy lifestyle overall can overall help you reduce your risk so that this doesn't, you know, this is something that can be, you know, taken head on and, you know, faced in a way that you feel like you have some control. So, so the answer is yes, there is a relation. Um, and that's, so there's a link between women who have breast and then an ovarian cancer. Now, obviously, there's some families where it just seems like it's exclusively breast and some women have ovarian, but there are some where it's kind of a crossover. Um, and so the testing tests for kind of both the gene, we know BRCA1 and 2 are both associated with breast and ovarian cancer. Um, so the answer, you know, in general is yes. So if you have somebody in your family who has breast and ovarian cancer, a breast cancer or an ovarian cancer, that can affect, you know, another family member and what their personal risk for cancer would be. Um, and particularly as it relates to breast cancer, uh, you know, sometimes think people don't think about is if you have a male relative that has breast cancer, because that's extremely rare for men to get it. So if you have a father, an uncle, or a grandfather who has it, then that's going to increase your risk as well. Um, and so that's important for people to be aware of, because a lot of times you don't associate that with men, because you don't think men and breast. Um, but that's important as well. Unfortunately, the, the t there's hereditary cancers, and there are what we call sporadic cancers, which are sometimes in the cell process, things just go wrong. Things just develop out of nowhere. Maybe you're the first person in your family to get it. Maybe, you know, it just came out of nowhere. Not all breast cancers are hereditary. They came from a specific mutation that we know about. So if it just popped up out of nowhere, we can't necessarily predict which gene or which mutation that was from. And, and those cancers that came out of nowhere that we call sporadic, those are not necessarily related to ovarian cancer. So it doesn't mean if you're diagnosed with breast cancer that I immediately say, geez, I gotta send you for you know, surveillance and screening for, for ovarian cancer. That's not the case. But when we see this hereditary trend, where you know where we see well you've had a cousin with ovarian cancer you've had an aunt with breast cancer you know we start to see things that suggest this is something you inherited from your family that's when we get worried and if we know that there's some sort of genetic or hereditary um, you know mutation then that's when we really start to worry about both coming together. I mean in that case I would say yeah they probably should get tested. Just Every male should get tested. So rare, yeah. but like you said more cancer is just random than it is hereditary but just because we know that that's such a rare cancer that would be something to get tested so if there is you know like Dr. Ferry has alluded to this test doesn't just affect you it affects the other women or other members in your family 
um, because if you're positive, there's a potential they could be positive. Um, and so that's why it's important to get tested if you have risk factors so we can identify you and then try to keep your risk as low as possible. And knowing if you have family members, we can try to keep their risk low too. There's certain other cancers that play a role, like colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, certain types of other cancers play a role and that kind of helps shape the overall risk. Not, not all lung cancer, not, you know, not necessarily lung cancer, skin cancer, which is, we know is often more environmental than hereditary. Um, but just to emphasize what Dr. Aaron said, these cancers we're talking about only represent 5 to 10% of all breast cancer. So we're talking about a very specific subset of hereditary cancers. He's right, you know, about 90% of breast cancers are sporadic. So this is a very small subset. Um, but I still would recommend any male get tested because it's extremely rare and there are a lot of mutations that we don't know about. So it's important to get tested. And one thing I didn't emphasize is entering clinical trials. Looking when, if you know you're positive, entering into clinical trials to be involved in the latest testing and detecting, etc. So especially because if you get tested um, and they didn't detect something, it doesn't mean they're not going to discover a new mutation that we find um, that we then can test for in the future. So I highly I, I agree that it's a good idea to get tested. The symptoms, I mean, the symptoms for ovarian cancer generally they can be. Sometimes non specific. Um, women can feel pressure, sometimes early satiety, meaning when they're eating, they get fuller sooner. Um, they can feel, obviously, sometimes pain, or it can even affect the urinary symptom, symptoms like urinary frequency, especially if there is um, you know, a mass that um, is you know, compressed against the bladder. Um, it can lead to urinary frequency. It can affect your GI system, you know, especially the symptoms would be you know, sometimes constipation, or um, they are very, sometimes, you know, like I. Like a, said a physician might start to think of GI, you know, or digestive problems um, with pressure and pain and constipation, but um, there's not, you know, necessarily one symptom that would uh, lead to more investigations or to look for ovarian cancer, because generally we start to get a picture depending on those, those symptoms that women would experience to start looking for ovarian cancer. But um, it's tricky because, you know, it's uh, often vague and nonspecific symptoms. Sure, yeah, and anytime you're worried about any kind of symptoms, you know, any symptoms at all, if you're worried, you know, certainly to talk to your doctor, or, but it, um, and then normally we would do an exam, you know, a, abdominal exam to, to check, and a pelvic exam to, you know, especially to check the and feel the uterus and the over, and the adnexa, meaning the ovaries, to feel if we feel anything suspicious, like fullness or any masses, obviously, would be things that we're looking for both sides are equally important as it relates to this so if some if your you know if your dad had it or his sister had it you know that's just as important as it relates to our kind of uh, figuring out where you fall in terms of the screening as if your mom's sister had it so they're equally important for us and I think some of that comes from the past the Gale model which was one of the other models that was used to try to calculate breast cancer risk and risk factors but the limitation was that sometimes I have it, with that, they talked about women who had two first-degree female relatives. Obviously, we could miss a lot of people because some women don't have two sisters or a mother and a sister that are alive to use for that risk factor. So that's where some of this testing has become so important to help us. Um, so the Thanks, breast sir. cancer gene testing, it involves a simple blood test, just like any other blood test that you would have, and it's a DNA analysis to see if you have any of the inherited genes. Now, it, being eligible for this test would depend on your family history, meaning if you have, um, you know, a brother or a sister or mother or father or aunt or uncle um, with a certain type of cancer, then you would be eligible for this test. But if you have no family history of cancer, then this test, you know, probably wouldn't be a benefit to you. Your insurance, most insurances will pay for this test. However, there are some that consider it investigational. So what we do is we draw your blood sample and we send it to this company that does the testing and they will hold the blood sample until they verify that your insurance company will or will not pay for it. And then there's always the option for you to pay for it and they do give discounted rates, um, you know, 
payment plans. Payment plans so that you can pay for the test if it's something that you really want. Well, this is for the hereditary cancers. Now, you're doing your routine screenings, your healthcare physicals, um, you know, that's required for men and women as we get older. So you're doing your normal tests. So for you, you know, you should get a prostate exam every year. You don't necessarily, if you have no family history, you don't necessarily need a genetic test to see if you carry the gene because you have no family history. So then you wouldn't be a candidate. So your routine health screenings you know, will indicate whether or not you're at risk for cancer based on certain blood tests and physical exams. Um, well, and that, that's true. And the reason that um, kind of like Dr. Horlick talked about, so, um, you know, for women who start having their periods earlier, their ovaries are kind of functioning a lot longer um, than someone who's starting to have their periods later. So by having those ovaries, in essence, function longer for a period of time, and that increases your risk. And so um, things that we know are protective for ovarian cancer to help reduce the risk are having children as well as being on birth control pills. Um, so in a woman who has not had any children, um, then her risk would, you would consider to be higher than someone who has. But of course, you know, once you, know, you sit down individually and we kind of look at all the pieces of the puzzle, that'll really tell us if that was significant enough to really increase your risk versus somebody else. Typically the way we operate is we have it done. When the tests come back, we have you to come back to meet with us individually, and we go over your results. If the test is negative, um, then we know that you don't have the mutation, but again, it doesn't mean your risk, your cancer risk is zero. So um, we would do based on the routine guidelines, which would either be you know doing your mammograms at age 40 every year, or like Dr. Ferry said, based on however the, how old the youngest person was, then we start 10 years earlier with the goal being to try to catch these cancers before they occur. Um, and same thing on the ovarian cancer, um, unfortunately, like Dr. Um, Horlick was saying, there isn't really good surveillance or screening tests like theirs for breast cancer, but we will you know, increase the frequency of pelvic exams, try to increase our surveillance. Um, you know, if your bracket came back positive, or if it came back negative, then we increase surveillance um, and things like if you have a strong family history, but if it came back positive, then we would talk about things like either just doing surveillance or considering surgery. And again, everything will be individualized because you know everybody doesn't want the same thing. Um, but if I had an 80-year-old patient who was diagnosed with DCIS and that's not invasive cancer, hey, that's great because we caught it early. And if that's the only person in that entire family who is diagnosed, no, I would not recommend genetic testing. Um, if I met someone who was 40 and was diagnosed, and that was the only person in the family, I would be much more likely to recommend that because we know that these, this subset of hereditary cancers tends to occur um, very, you know, earlier diagnosis, so earlier in life. So 80-year-old DCIS, no. Absolutely not. I would not recommend it. Okay, what is it? Um, it? It is not cancer. It has a very, very high likelihood of leading to cancer, so much so that we recommend excising all of it. Um, so it can I say 100% that it proceeds to cancer? No, but I can um, probably the studies tell us about 90% of it does progress because they are cancerous cells they just haven't yet invaded the tissue and so when when we offer surgery for DCIS our goal is always negative margins we don't want to leave any DCIS behind um, and, and it's treated very similarly in that if we take out just a part of the breast we would recommend radiation for that area that's left behind because we're that worried we treat it virtually the same as cancer with a slight difference in how we approach lymph nodes. So, sure. so again, if you would join me in, um, I think it was very informative, and, um, and uh, join me in thanking them for doing this.